Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at the American political system in a comparative perspective. In this video, we'll look at the U.S. system of federalism and situate that system in a broader consideration of the distribution of political power and authority between central and local governments. Most American students are familiar, at least in some ways, with the idea of federalism. In the United States, political power is divided between the various layers of government, each of which maintains a degree of autonomy from the other. This system was codified in the U.S. Constitution, most clearly in the Tenth Amendment, which declares that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. What does this look like in practice? In the simplest terms, it means that there are some powers of governing that belong to the national government. Because of the Tenth Amendment, the powers granted the federal government are those explicitly mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, as well as those necessary and proper to carry out those granted powers. Because of this, they're sometimes called expressed powers. These include things like making treaties, regulating foreign and interstate commerce, maintaining the military, and declaring war. The Tenth Amendment also provides that any power not specifically granted to the federal government is reserved to the states. Because of this, these are sometimes referred to as the reserved powers. These include a wide variety of governmental functions, including things like establishing local governments, establishing public education systems, conducting elections, providing for the common good, and all other powers not formally granted to the federal government or explicitly denied to the states. And finally, there's a third group of powers that are shared by both the federal and state governments. Because of this, they're sometimes referred to as concurrent powers. This category includes a variety of activities, such as collecting taxes, borrowing money, making and enforcing laws, and establishing a judiciary. Under a federal system, both the national and state governments have independent authority. They are each responsible to the people, and they are forced to cooperate and share powers in many areas. The United States is one of about 25 countries worldwide that practice federalism. Other federal states include India, Brazil, Germany, Nigeria, Mexico, Canada, Russia, Belgium, and others. Federalism tends to be far more common in large and populous and diverse countries as it permits subsidiarity, the idea that decisions should be made as close to the people, that is, at the lowest level of government possible. It also permits greater regional variation and local autonomy, ensuring that diverse populations can establish governments that meet their specific needs. But this is hardly the only way to organize political power in a country. In a unitary system, all power flows from the center, the national state, and voters delegate authority to the national government, which then in turn makes binding decisions for the entire country. Where local governments exist, they are only able to exercise those powers explicitly delegated or granted to them by the national government, and the national government can override or revoke their powers. Unitary systems are the most common form of political organization in the world today. Indeed, about 85% of all countries in the world have unitary system. Uh, examples of unitary states include Japan, France, the United Kingdom, South Korea, Israel, New Zealand, and many, many others. Unitary systems tend to function best in smaller and less populous countries and in countries with less diverse populations. They also tend to have more centralized political systems. Most state governments in the United States operate according to unitary systems, where local and municipal governments have only those powers explicitly granted to them by the state governments. But at the national level, the U.S. has a federal system. There have also been examples of confederal systems where the national government exercises only those powers explicitly granted to it by these subnational or state governments. Historically, the United States under the Articles of Confederation prior to the adoption of the U.S. Constitution in 1789 operated in this way. The power of the national government was extremely limited, and most political authority rested with the states. A case can be made that the European Union operates in a, in a similar way or under a confederation to today. In such political systems, political authority is highly decentralized. We can identify three basic principles of federalism, requirements to be considered a federal system. 
First, in a federal system, the national and subnational governments must be independently elected and directly responsible to the people. Second, the Constitution must establish the independence of each level, guaranteeing the sovereignty of each and dividing responsibilities for governance between them. And finally, federal systems must have some way to represent regional or subnational preferences within the national political institutions. Most frequently, this is accomplished through the legislature, where a second chamber is usually structured to provide representation to the subnational units. In both Germany and the United States, for example, the upper chamber of the legislature provides for representation of the subnational governments. This is a common structural feature of federal systems. But even in the context of other federal systems, the United States has some unusual features. First, while most federal systems provide for representation of subnational governments in the legislature, the U.S. is the only federal system which provides for equal representation of the states or of the subnational units, regardless of population, and explicitly states in the Constitution that this feature can never be amended. Over time, growing inequality between states in terms of their, their population has laid, led to greater inequality and in representation in the U.S. Senate. When the U.S. Constitution was drafted, the ratio of the largest to the smallest state populations was about 13 to 1, meaning the largest state had a population about 13 times that of the smallest. Today, the ratio is closer to 70 to 1. As a result, the people who reside in the country's largest states are relatively underrepresented and therefore have less power in the Senate relative to the people in the less populous states. Second, the United States is unique in not granting representation to the people who live in the country's capital, Washington, D.C. Other federal systems have a capital district, but provide rep for representation of the people in that district in the legislature. The U.S. is also unusual in that it does not provide representation for people residing in territories like Puerto Rico, American Samoa, or Guam. Other countries which have federal systems provide for the representation of all citizens, regardless of the region or district in which they live. Third, the United States is unusual in its decision to leave the conduct of elections solely to the subnational units. The U.S. does not define when the states hold their elections, uh, doesn't define generally the rules under which those elections operate, and as a result, there's, wide a there's a wide variety or variation within electoral systems and timing for elections for offices in states can vary greatly. And finally, the U.S. is unusual in its integration of the party system across all regions. In the United States, Republicans and Democrats compete in national and state elections, and there are no real regional parties with any real influence. Australia and Mexico are similar in this respect, but in most other federal systems, there's a combination of national parties and parties with more regional power bases, often even national parties operating under different names and labels at the regional level. Belgium, for example, has numerous parties which are based in local, largely linguistic regions. So that concludes our brief discussion of American federalism in a comparative perspective. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section below, and thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good day.